Hello, this is Hydratech, 5th of January 2012. This is a progress video for the Muller motor and Muller motor driver boards I've been working on. What we're looking at here is the current state of development for the Muller motor. It's largely complete, certainly functional at this point. Behind this smaller circular rotor is a round PCB that houses 15 latching hull effect sensors. That means each sensor will require two different magnetic poles in order for it to switch from one logic state to another on its output. That output is fed into a circuit board I'll discuss in a short while. I'll be testing these uh, circuit boards or the latest incarnation of them tonight against one coil only. This one. TDC or call number zero. I will be monitoring two things. On this multimeter I'll be monitoring the amp draw from the brand new 12 volt rechargeable battery which will feed the power rail. On this multimeter I'll be monitoring the generated voltage which is maintained by this capacitor over here. Of more interest are the circuit boards themselves. In my previous video I already discussed these two boards. This is the full wave bridge bank board and behind that is the capacitor bank board. There's nothing new there, same as before. These two boards are different though. Different from the ones I discussed in my last video. In as much as they've been updated to allow me to do what I want to do in terms of testing in a more flexible manner. Now, on the right hand side is the outgoing component or handler for the two-way conversation between the Arduino and the Muller motor. On the right hand side is the incoming component for the same thing. Now, the whole effort sensors, 15 of them, put out their values across these 15 wires. They are processed by this board and the board resolves them to a 4-bit address from right to left represented by these LEDs. There's a bit 1, bit 2, bit 3, bit 4, so numerically that's 1, 2, 4 and 8. This last LED is simply used for error checking because these two LEDs generate an interrupt and should there be uh, an occasion where both are on that means an interrupt is being attempted at the same time on both of them and that's an error condition and the Arduino code can handle that. The resultant 4-bit address represented by the Hall effect sensor is fed to the Arduino, it's processed there and then that same address is used or a different address is used and fed to this board here which generally allows uh, the Arduino to send a pulse to a coil of choice. It doesn't have to be the, the same coil that it's received uh, from the Hall effect sensor. It could be another coil or it could be the next one in sequence. The upshot of it all is that the Arduino now has full control through these two boards over the firing sequence of the coils. They need not be sequential. and That's a key thing to, to remember with this. Anyway, this board here then feeds out a pulse via these optooscillators onto one of five coils. Only five are implemented right now, but this whole system has been developed to allow up to 15 coils. This will be coil zero, which is TDC, and numerically this will become, let's see now, that's TDC, so that's zero, so that'll be zero, three, six, nine, and twelve. Down here are five identical boards. This is the power handling side, which is completely optically isolated from the logic side over here. By the way, the logic side is coupled to the whole sensors, so the whole sensors are also completely isolated from the power side. That's why these two boards are fed via 5 volts, 
the hall sensors require 10 volts, uh, they both share a common ground. But on this side, it's really important that they do not share a common ground. I say this because I have already ruined the power supply circuitry on one notebook because of the transients that appeared on ground. Further study will be required to get to the root cause of that, but let's bye bye to that notebook. Now, these circuits here, I'll only discuss one because recall they are all identical. Let's look at this one here. We have this connection block here, this terminal block. At the top, we have common ground. Here, the white wire which is this, any one of these, white wire feeds the actual signal, the pulsing signal, onto a TC4427 MOSFET driver. This one signal is bridged in order to simultaneously allow the pulsing on both inputs of that MOSFET driver. I split it this way so that at a later date, should I choose to or find reason to uh, pulse both sides of the inputs or both sides of the MOSFETs separately, then I have the option to do so. This blue wire here, I can move in closer, hope it doesn't go out of focus. This blue wire here is the power rail positive. These two red wires here are the actual pulsing voltage that the TC4427 will use. That's to say that the voltage carried on these two wires whose ground is here, that voltage will be used on the gate of the MOSFETs. In this case, those are fed by a separate 12 volt power supply and the gates are being driven hard. These twisted pair wires here are the ends of each coil pair. That is essentially it. The MOSFETs are centered here and the ICs on either side are purely very fast switching diodes. The heat sink is nothing more than a quarter inch thick aluminium bar, stock bar, and it's more than adequate for this purpose at this time. There's no finning at the back or anything like that, there's no airflow or anything. The MOSFETs themselves are electrically isolated from each other uh, from the tabs. Uh, I wasn't sure if this would have a negative effect if I if, uh, allowed the tabs to short because of the aluminium but I chose to isolate them electrically just in case. Now what I'll do next is I will uh, place the camera in a more suitable position to allow uh, you to see the readouts of these multimeters and at the same time hopefully bring into focus these LEDs so you can see what's happening as the overall scene is superimposed alongside another video. So if you just bear with me a moment I'll do that right now. Okay, the cameras are set up now. At the moment, um, the amp draw from the battery is 70 to 80 milliamps. That's the battery feeding the power rail. Just like to note that uh, these two circuit boards here uh, actually do run independently of one another. So as I turn the rotor, you can see over here that the rotor position is reflected by those LEDs which go on to the Arduino. They are, remember, a binary value. Currently we're looking at 14, a value of 14. Now it's 0, which is TDC. Okay, over here we can see that the Arduino is set up to put out a pulse stream whose period is 100 millisecond and the high component is 1 millisecond. The blue top wave 4 is for the coil probe whose ground is the common ground for the power rail which is of course the negative lead on the battery. Over here 
this is channel B, that's the pulses, it's connected, that probe is connected to the pulse, pulses coming out of the optoisolators. The ground for that probe is the common ground for, which supplies VDD and ground to the actual driver boards themselves and hands on to the TC4427s. Okay, as I said, there's a one millisecond high on the pulses. I'll change that. Before I do that, yeah, we'll just double check. It's 70 to 80 milliamps on the battery. I'll change that to 10 milliseconds and reprogram that. And I'll ask you to note that whilst reprogram takes place, the amp draw from the battery should go down to zero. And whilst the Arduino is being programmed, this light comes on. There we are. The amp draws down to zero. And this is critical because the amp draw from the battery must go down to zero whilst reprogramming takes place. In other words, amp draw to the back from the battery must go down to zero whilst any form of interruption for the power supply on the Arduino or the control circuitry takes place. It's a safety feature as I find out to my cost. Okay, we see now that it's gone close to one amp for a 10 millisecond high on the pulses. I'll take that up to 20 milliseconds and reprogram that and hopefully reproduce the results on the amp draw from the battery which should go down to zero. There's the indicator on the left there shown as being reprogrammed. Okay, that's two amps. Now that puts into question the quality of the wiring I've used, especially that carrying the uh, volts and amps on the power rail. So I'll take that back down to um, one millisecond with a pulse high and reprogram that. I kid you not when I tell you that the amp draw from the battery shoots up very, very fast. So you can go from a situation where the temperature of your MOSFETs is comfortably low to a situation where the temperature on those same MOSFETs is uh, disastrously high. Really, really quick. Anyway, these tests will be carry out, carried out uh, across all of the five implemented coils and I'll be collating the results. And the whole point behind this is to give me an insight into the effectiveness of my implementation of the Muller motor and the current implementation of the uh, supporting circuitry. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Stay tuned, and I will be uh, posting further updates, especially when I start to test this Muller motor as a motor. Bearing in mind, all tests and the one that I've shown just now is for one stationary coil. The rotor was not going around at all. Anyway, thanks again.